No, that was tremendous. I'm glad to be a First Baptist Church. Boy, appreciate the music choir. I thought you did a great job. Mrs. Green loved that song. We want us love. That was a great job. We were blessed with a number of musical talent here at First Baptist Church. I'm glad to be here at First Baptist Church. I'm glad to hear some people saying amen and uh, actually enjoying what's going on at First Baptist Church, too. Sometimes I wonder if you're awake or dead. <laughs> neither one's a good option at church. <laughs> okay, neither one's a good option. We're glad you're here tonight, except for what God has for us. I'm beginning a new series like I did this morning, a new series on Sunday nights as well. Today is a day for all things becoming new at First Baptist Church. This one, I can't promise, will just be six or eight weeks. I'll tell you that right now. Because uh, we're going to look at another book of the Bible. And I did a book before, the book of James. And I did the book of First John. And I've been praying about what book to look at next on Sunday nights. And I've been praying, reading some things. The Lord directed me to this particular book that we're going to look at. I don't know how long it'll take to go through the book. But we'll go through the book verse by verse or section by section as we study God's word in, in what's called sometimes an exegetical or verse by verse manner. We want to look at the whole counsel of God. That's why I preach from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I preach from different books in the Bible as well. All of the Bible is good. The Bible uh, it says of itself that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Verse 17 of that 1 Timothy chapter 3, um, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17 says that the man of God, and listen, ladies, that does not exclude, that does not exclude ladies, all right? It's the man of God is referring to mankind in general. There is a, a couple of new versions that every time or many times when the Bible says man, it changes it to gender inclusive words uh, just so no one feels left out. Now listen, I don't want a Bible that changes the words so no one feels bad. I just want to know what God says. All right, just tell me what God says, and the Holy Spirit will illuminate it for us. And we're looking at that in our senior Bible class right now. But the Bible says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The point of Scripture, the inspiration of the, of the Bible and Scripture, is that you and I, as children of God, would be complete before Him. Thoroughly furnished or completely equipped for everything we handle in life. We're all going to handle different things in life. You're going to handle a coworker that I won't handle. You're going to handle a coworker who's going to be a jerk. The Bible will equip you on how to handle the coworker who's a jerk. A soft answer turneth away wrath. A man's gift maketh room for him. The Bible will deal with those things. It'll deal with how, how you're supposed to act when your children don't obey. The Bible will equip you for that. The Bible will equip you when the lady at the cash register gives you too much change. The Bible speaks to that and will equip you so you are thoroughly equipped, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is a practical book. It's a practical for today. It's practical for tomorrow. It is one of my, I would say, preaching philosophies is to try to bring God's word in a practical sense for you so that when you leave each service, you may not know all that I said. In fact, you may not know much of what I said, but hopefully you get something I said and it applies to tonight or tomorrow when you wake up and you got to go to the line or got to go to the shop or got to go to the store or got to go to school that you think, wow, God wants me to be different because of his word. Word. It doesn't matter what I say. I could write a long book of opinions. It had many chapters in it. Ladies, you could write a book of opinions. I know my wife could write a book of opinions too for me. It'd be a long book as well. No doubt about that. It doesn't matter what I say. It matters what he says. So as we study a book of the Bible, it's, uh, uh, sometimes it can get a little bit, a little bit deep or a little bit uh, uh, poignant inside of that. But I think it's helpful for us. Helpful for us as we study God's Word, look at God's Word, and learn from God's Word. And if you would tonight, open your Bible to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. I don't know that I have a favorite book. Probably whichever one I'm currently studying would be my favorite book. I am, I am blessed to be paid to study the Word of God. I'm I get paid to study the Word of God. 
You, you hope that I study for, I preach, but I love to study the Word of God and, uh, and uh, to try to uh, uncover those things which, which may be deeper or, or whatever. And so look at the book of Colossians, a tremendous book of the Bible, a fabulous book of the Bible, a powerful book in the Bible. I want you to direct your attention just to one verse tonight, and then I want to give you some background and some lessons from the book and kind of just give you a broad, a broad swipe tonight from the book of Colossians. Answering this question, why Colossians? And why me and Colossians? Answering the question, why Colossians? And why me and Colossians? What does it matter to me? What does it matter to me, the average Joe? And the fact is, we're all average. That's the nature of the word average. What does it matter to me? This book written... Back almost now 2,000, just a little bit short of, of 2,000 years ago. What does it matter to me? Why should I listen to what's in this book besides it being God's word? Is there something for me today? Is there something for me at home tonight? Is there something for me with my parents, young person? Is there something for me with my friends at school? Is there something for me at my job? Is there something for me when I go to Speedway? And the answer, unequivocally, yes, there is. I'd like you to direct your attention to one verse that I would, I would submit is the key to Colossians. Chapter 1, and verse number 18. The Bible says, and he, as we get to that passage of Scripture, we'll notice that that is Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, that in all, that in everything, in every manner of life, in every attitude, in every desire of life, in every word that is uttered, in every thought that is thought in our head, with every motivation, with every pleasure that we find, with every bit of satisfaction and contentment, that in all things he, that is Jesus, might have the preeminence. Or that Jesus might be numero uno. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight as we look, Lord, just in a broad sense at the book of Colossians. May our hearts be challenged. Lord, may our minds be compelled. Lord, may our spirit be convicted in ways that maybe we have not to giving you what is due to you. Lord, I ask for your help during this time. Help me as I speak. Lord, please, I need your help. Without you, I can do nothing. But Lord, help those who listen to listen well to your word and your spirit. Would you take your word and, Lord, strike to our hearts the inner desires and thoughts and intents. Lord, just what needs to be struck and things that need to be struck down. Lord, would you strike them down tonight? Things that need to be built up, would you build them up tonight? But Lord, would you do a work tonight in this service? Lord, use your word, I ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Book of Colossians. It was written, the Bible tells us, in the first verse, by Paul. Not too many people uh, disagree that it was Paul who wrote it, but there is one or two along the way, as there is always the haters, who say, well, Paul didn't write this because he used a word in here that he never used before. If we were to take three snippets of your conversations, would we ever find a word that you hadn't used in another conversation? Quite possibly. But I think very well established by many facts, by many other, uh, by many other authoritative issues that Paul wrote this book. It is supposed to be in the Bible and written by the Apostle, uh, by the apostle Paul, saved on the road, formerly Saul, now Paul, and wrote now, to the church at Colossae. It was written while Paul was in bondage. We find that, if you have your Bibles open there, we find that in the very last verse of the book. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. History tells us, the Bible tells us, that most likely Paul wrote this when he was in bondage, when he was in chains, before he was going to stand before Caesar. 
He would never during this time, we find out from history, ever be released from this. And he's writing some letters. There were four books written during this particular time frame. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. All written, the history tells us, around 60 to 62 A.D., almost 2,000 years ago. Can you believe that? Almost 2,000 years ago, and still when we read it, can touch our hearts tonight. You know what that is? That's the inspiration. That's the power of God. That, that means this was not just Paul's words of a guy sitting in jail, uh, having maybe in our minds a bad time, a hard time. No, this was a man of God who was moved by the Holy Ghost to pen some words to a small church in the city of Colossae. Almost 2,000 years ago. It was written while Paul was in bonds, written around these other, this other time. But Paul had never been to this church at Colossae before. As far as we understand, he'd never, he would never be able to go to this church. In fact, you'll see that when you look in verse number 7, as ye also, in chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 7, as also ye learned... Of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of, of Christ. If you were to look back at the first few verses, you'd find that what Paul is saying is, listen, you know these things about Jesus Christ, you know these things about your salvation, and you heard them from this guy over here. You haven't heard them from me. I've never been there before. So Paul is now writing to a church who has never known the ministry of Paul in a face-to-face -face situation. Though they've known of Paul, you'd be hard-pressed to be a Christian in A.D. 60 and not know of Paul. You'd be hard-pressed, if not impossible, around the globe to be saved and not know of Paul. And here's a church that had not ever maybe met Paul. A church that was around within just about 15 miles of two other churches, three good churches in about a, about a 15 mile radius. There's Colossae, there's a church, there's a church uh, called Her Herapolis in chapter 4 verse 13. And there's a church that you might have heard of called Laodicea. Now, can everyone imagine, can everyone think where else they've heard the, the word of Laodicea, the church at Laodicea? Anybody want to shout out to me where else they hear that word? Revelation, the church at Laodicea. Anybody remember good church or bad church? Ah, I'll tell you right now, it's a trick question. It was a good church. The Lord liked all the churches. Were they perfect? They weren't a perfect church. All right, we'll see that if we read to Revelation about, about some things about the churches. That, that, but, but they're into this 15-mile radius. And in fact, in chapter 4, Paul will say to this church, Colossae, listen, read this and take it over to those other churches and read it over there. And by the way, I wrote a letter to Laodicea. We don't have that particular letter, not our, part of the inspiration, but the Bible says that Paul said, I wrote an epistle to Laodicea and read that one back at your church. These three churches who were all saved by the power of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, were actually working together just a little bit. Well, would you look at that? They were working together just a little bit. You know, it's not a problem to work with other Christ-honoring churches. Now, there's some churches, some gatherings that we, we can't work with to be true to the Word of God. We'll look at on Wednesday night the five fundamentals, but it's all right to have a church. We're going to have, like I mentioned this morning, a soul winning conference. I'm inviting other like minded, Christ honoring, uh, blood washed churches to come with us. They're not our enemies, they're our fellow laborers. They're our friends. I hope you have friends in other Bible preaching, Bible believing churches. That's the way it's supposed to be. And Paul says, listen, go over there about, about uh, I think it's 12 miles to Laodicea, and go over there and read that and read that back over here. About the distance it'd be from us to Community Baptist in Saginaw, maybe a little bit less distance. Go there and, and read this back and forth. The background it was a church that was. The challenge, but there was a background, but there was some beguilement in the church, which may, we believe is the reason that Paul was writing the church of Colossae. Some ideas, some philosophies had snuck in and begun to be deceitful to these young Christians. You know, the devil is always trying to deceive us in our walk before Jesus Christ. He's always trying to trick us. And beyond that, there will be and there are false teachers. It's not just the devil you have to walk, watch out for. There will be and there are false teachers. There will be false teachers as you go online and you can see 
false teachers. They will tell you things about the Bible that are not true. They will tell you things about the Spirit of God that are not true. They will tell you that you must live a certain way in order to, to have the full anointing of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't act in a certain way and flop on the floor and jump up and down and get all crazy, then you don't really know of the saving grace of Jesus Christ and the blessing and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They're false teachers. And Paul is writing inside the Colossians to these ideas that come up. The city of Colossae is in modern-day Turkey. They tell me, historians tell me, when I studied that, during that time, the city was known for some religions that borrowed from religion. So what would happen is these religions would begin to just merge all their ideas in a kind of an eclectic, tolerant religion. What the scholars tell me is I studied that in Colossae, what they were dealing with, these religions, these ideas, these religious gatherings were places that you could just come and no one had really a bad idea. Your religious philosophy was accepted and yours was accepted and we're all one big happy religious gathering. One religious, we're all going to heaven. Boy, does that sound familiar or not? Is there not that same idea today? Boy, listen, you can't, you can't believe that. That's too extreme. You mean that, that God only lets those go to heaven who trust in him? Boy, that's way too exclusive. Listen, you need to be inclusive and, and that God wants to save everybody. And he wants to save everybody. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all. All right, Jesus said, if I then be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. But it's not that everyone's ideas can be okay. It's not that we can just take some kind of big religious pot and dump everything in it like a glorified um, chopped cooking show and, out, and, and pop out some type of religious experience. And Paul is dealing with some philosophy here and specifically they were blending some Jewish legalism with Greek philosophy and oriental mysticism. They were combining some of the Jewish legalistic ideas that you must be circumcised, you must follow the law, and if you don't do these things, then you're not a good Christian. Listen, we have heard that in our Christian circles before, not here at First Baptist Church. We've heard that. Listen, you're only a good Christian if your hair is cut this short, and if you wear a tie this long, and if you do this, and if you do that. Now, a Christian ought to please God. A Christian ought to look different. A Christian ought to act different. But I am not a, a great Christian because of my tie. I'm only a good Christian if Jesus Christ is doing a work in my heart. They were combining the Jewish legalistic, uh, Jewish legalism into this philosophy and saying, and they were trying to impose some traditions. And listen, you're only honoring Christ if you do this or if you do this. And Paul is writing Colossians to strike down some of those thoughts. I shared a few weeks ago, but now people go so far the other direction, they almost tell you not even to read your Bible. I think you ought to read your Bible every single day. But you don't read your Bible just to check off a list. You read your Bible to spend time with the author of the Bible. His name is God. You read the Bible to be fully fur furnished, thoroughly equipped. They were combining the Greek philosophy. They were, they were exalting knowledge in the book of Colossians. Exalting these big thoughts, this philosophy. Boy, you're a great Christian if you had these big, high and lofty thoughts. In a sense, they were exalting education. Again, that sounds familiar. That really what trumps everything is science and data. And knowledge. And that doesn't trump everything. It doesn't. It never trumps Jesus Christ. Don't be deceived. I'm not against science. I'm not against medicine. I'm not against education. But I am against anything that exalts itself above Jesus Christ. And they were, he was dealing with some philosophy things and then some oriental mysticism that combined quite a, a flavor of Christianity. If I can, I'd say this, the Colossians to us presents only Jesus. 
It presents the sufficiency of Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus, the fullness of Jesus, of the person, the work, and the deity of Jesus Christ. Or in a practical sense, what do dumb or, or um, what do lollipops, truffles, and the Christian life all have in common? It's what's in the center that matters. What's in the center, Christian? It has to be Jesus Christ. Let me give you just a couple thoughts about that. We won't be long tonight. A couple thoughts about this. We see in chapter 1. If you have your Bible, see in chapter 1. We'll kind of flip through each chapter briefly. Chapter 1, we are introduced to Jesus Christ. We're introduced to Jesus Christ in chapter 1. We see in verse 17, speaking of Jesus, and he, that is Jesus, is before all things, and by him all things consist. When we get to the point and study Colossians chapter 1, we're going to find out that Jesus was the creator of everything that you and I see. He's the one that holds everything together. He's the head of the body. All right, He is the firstborn. He is the beginning. The Bible says elsewhere in Revelation, Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, in case you miss it. And it tells us in Hebrews he is the author and the finisher of our faith he is Jesus is all things we're introduced in chapter 1 to Jesus Christ and listen my friend you ought to be introduced to Jesus Christ and if you know him you ought to introduce others to Jesus Christ if you're living your life just for yourself just to go to work and go back home and you're not introducing people to Jesus Christ you are missing the point my job your job is to introduce other people to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about this, Jesus. You look around, you see that true? That's because of Jesus. You see this marriage right here? It's because of Jesus. You see this church? It's because of Jesus. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Everything that you see is because of Jesus. You ought to introduce people to Jesus Christ. If you're not, my friend, I feel sorry for you. How are you going to answer that question when you stand before God one day? Well, why didn't you talk about me? I gave you life. I'm giving you eternal life. I rescued you from the bondage of sin and saved you from eternal separation and punishment. Why couldn't you tell anyone else about me? What's your answer going to be? Well, well, Lord, you don't understand. The, um, I don't know. Well, they might have said something rude to me. I might have offended them. You might have offended them? I'm just proposing the conversation. Of course, it won't go like this, but can you imagine that conversation? You might have offended them. Do you not think they're offended now as they suffer for all eternity? My child, can I not reverence you back when I gave you the, the story about the rich man of Lazarus who, being in hell, lifted up his eyes in torment. And he asked for a drop of water. And then he asked that Lazarus would go back and witness to his unsaved loved ones. And you worried about offending them? Well, Lord, I couldn't talk about you because the sign said no soliciting. So I had to walk away. Because if I had knocked, I, it would have been really rude if I knocked on the door and said no soliciting. So they clearly, they clearly didn't want me to say anything. And Lord, I can't go past a no soliciting sign. My child. They ran Paul out of town. They stoned him. My child. James. Beheaded. John. Exiled. My child. Look at my hands. I was crucified. And you couldn't go past a no soliciting sign? A few years back, I was soul winning. Big sign on the door. No soliciting, not if you're a church, not if you're selling something. We have big dogs. We're a lease of dogs on you. I was with some teenagers at that time. And I walked up to the door. And they said, Pastor J.D., what are you doing? I said, <laughs> I said you'd be surprised. I, not, I, I just, you know, I knock on those doors. Knocked on the door and the lady came to the door. As nice a person as you could meet. We're looking for a church. Well, let me give you a tract about our church. Gave him a tract. Locked away. And I hope they learned something that day. What are you going to say? 
We're, we are introduced to Jesus Christ, and we need to be introducing others to Jesus Christ. It's chapter 1, chapter 2. Chapter 1, we are introduced to Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, we find out we are established in Jesus Christ. Look in verse number 7 of chapter 2. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. We're introduced in chapter 1 and chapter 2. We find out that our strength, our stability in life comes in the foundation of Jesus Christ. Why? You can walk through life with an attitude that pleases him and confounds the unsaved. Why? You can travel through a hardship in life, through great tragedy, through a trial, and still have an enduring peace and a hopeful joy and contentment. Is because you're not established and you shouldn't be established in all the things that you have or wishing the things you don't have or in the life that you think is nice and pretty or the life that's not. You don't find your contentment, your attitude in those things. You don't find your peace in those things, you find your stability, your establishment in Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock, I stand. And I'm right there. And I find my strength not because my knees are locked, not because I'm holding on, but because I'm established on Jesus Christ. You see, when you're established on something else, You'll be like this in life. You'll be an emotional roller coaster. When life is good and the, the counts are full, you'll be up on cloud nine. When trouble hits, you're down in the depths. You know what that shows? That shows the mark of an immature believer who's not established in Jesus Christ. I'm not being rude. I'm not being mean. I'm not hating on you. I'm just telling you, when you're established in Jesus Christ, no matter how the winds howl, you won't be moved. Because you're established where? On Jesus Christ. We find out in chapter 1, we're introduced to Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, we we'll find out we're established in Jesus Christ. Boy, you could stay right there for a whole year, couldn't you? You could stay there last year in 2020. What are you established on? You established on your health or Jesus Christ? You established on work or on Jesus Christ? Established on Jesus Christ. That's how Paul and Silas could sing in jail. Because they weren't established in the comfort of life. They were established in the confidence of Christ. We're to introduce the establishment of Jesus Christ, chapter 2. Chapter 3, we find out that we must respond to Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 3, verse number 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify. Therefore, we find out that because of Jesus Christ, we're introduced to him, we're established by him. Now we have to respond to him. We're not just saved to say, I've got Jesus and nothing else matters. No, I've got Jesus, so everything matters. We find out we must respond to Jesus Christ. Uh, verse number two says, set your affections on things above. That doesn't mean you can't have things down here. It does mean that you better not be just satisfied with things down here. You better not have a bad day when you don't get something down here. He says, set your affections a little bit higher than what you can see. Set them on what you can't see. And his name is Jesus Christ. We respond because of Jesus Christ. And then chapter number four, we must live for Jesus Christ. Found in verse number five, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Life is short, my friends. This may be for some the very last church service they're ever at or ever here. Life is short. Redeem the time. He commands us to redeem the time, Paul does, because of Jesus Christ. You see, the point of Colossians is only Jesus. I asked the men today to put that on the screen. I want up there the whole time, just those two words under Colossians, only Jesus. You see, because of Jesus, Jesus must impact every single area of your life. Tonight I want you to think and be challenged by this thought. Has Jesus impacted 
every area of my life. You see, because of Jesus, the response to Jesus, the idea of the priority of Jesus is a fundamental life-altering response. It is not just a mere external adaptation where I bring a big Bible or put on a nice set of clothes or even go to church three times a week, though those are all good things and they can honor the Lord. But fundamentally, on the inside, here, I am changed and altered by Jesus Christ. And I am different because of Jesus Christ. That means my family is operating not because I just want my kids to be a good name for the house, but because of Jesus Christ. And you obey your parents' children, not so you don't get in trouble. And Christian, we don't live and do right just so God doesn't bop us on the head. We live and do right because of Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constrains me. It is a fundamental life-altering response. My love for my spouse, my response to my spouse is different because of Jesus Christ. I work hard at the shop. I work hard in the office, not just so that others think, well, he's a hard worker and he has a good work ethic and he has character, though I hope they think those things. I work hard and I work to the best of my ability because of Jesus Christ. It is a fundamental life altering response and attitude of Jesus Christ. Your mood must be because of Jesus Christ. When you make up tomorrow morning, you wake up with a smile and a, and a sweet spirit, not because you feel like it, because you probably won't when the alarm goes off. You wake up that way because of Jesus Christ. You rejoice and say, this is the day that the Lord hath made, and it's bright and early out today. It's still dark out today. I don't feel great today, but this is his day. I will rejoice because of Jesus Christ. Your contentment. You may not have the new car you want, the new home you want, but you're content. Not because you just grin and bear it or say, fine, it's my lot in life, but you're content because you have Jesus in your life and you have everything. Your dreams may look different, but it's okay because Jesus will make what you do to be profitable. Your goals, everything because of Jesus or only Jesus. Point of Colossians. It's Jesus. There's a man who asked what the Lord had done for him. He began to illustrate it. He grabbed some twigs and some leaves. He put them in a little circle. And he took a worm and he put the worm in the middle of the circle. And he lit the leaves and the sticks on fire. And slowly the fire creeped closer and closer to the worm. Before the worm was burnt... He picked the worm up and set in a fresh patch of dirt to enjoy its worminess. And he said, this is what Jesus did for me. He plucked me and he set me. And I'm forever grateful for him. There's a story told about a vendor who sold bagels. Bagels cost at that time 50 cents. As the story goes, every morning a jogger would run by and he'd drop two quarters, 50 cents, into the small cup there, never taking a bagel, just dropped two quarters and continued on his route that morning. Happened morning after morning after morning. Till one morning the vendor stopped the jogger along the way. He said, excuse me, sir, can I have a word with you? And the jogger stopped his run and he he said, I know, I know, you're probably wondering why I drop in 50 cents every day and don't, and don't take a bagel. I know. And the vendor stopped and said, no, 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 that, that's not what I want to stop you for. Just want to let you know that bagels have now gone up to 60 cents. <laughs> you say, Pastor, where are you going with that? It's often how we treat God. We're ungrateful for what is given to us. We expect something else and say, God, by the way, things have gone up to 60 cents. I'm still here. The one who doesn't owe us anything has given us everything. Why Colossians? Only Jesus. How does it affect you and me? Because tomorrow, when you wake up, Jesus you smile because of Jesus. You're kind because of Jesus. You obey, you work hard in school because of Jesus. And if it's not because of Jesus, my friend, you're missing it. You're not established. 
The beautiful thing about the books of the Bible and Colossians specifically is often, I imagine, as I read, I'm convicted and challenged. I imagine the church was convicted and challenged as well. Bet they sat there, ugh, ow. Paul never met us, but whew, he sure knew us. And 2,000 years later, because of the inspiration of the Bible and God's word, we can say, Paul never met us, but he sure knew us. Where's Jesus at tonight in your life? Only Jesus? Is there something else? Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, a convicting, or hopefully thought-provoking idea. I pray that your word would touch us tonight, Lord. That as you reveal what's inside, Lord, if we don't see Jesus Christ, will we tonight come before you and humbly bow a knee? Lord, may we live our life because of Jesus Christ. We not act a certain way just to be a good character or good ethic. Because of your son, Jesus Christ. My friend, in a moment we'll stand and pray. I wonder if here, if it's Jesus. If it's not, come on back to Jesus. He stands there with arms wide open. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how it can be only Jesus right here. Lord, bless this invitation. May we be honest. Lord, not try to deceive ourselves. May we respond to the way we are supposed to tonight. In Jesus' name.